Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's video. For those of you who are getting a little tired of the small lamps that I've been featuring lately, boy, have we got to change of pace for you. How about this massive and magnificent Harmony Model H322 base amp from 1961? From what I can gather uh, from internet research, it was built by Electrolab for Harmony and it has, now sit down because this is a shock, four 8-inch speakers that are driven by a pair of fixed bias 7591 tubes. Now if this sounds like an interesting combination to you, sort of like a mini Fender Bassman, then pull up the easy chair and get ready because we're about to embark on a perilous journey into vintage amp restoration. Let's start off with our uh, traditional evaluation of the exterior of the amp. Uh, this is no shrinking violet here. It's 19 and a half inches across by 22 inches tall. Okay, about four times bigger than the amps I've been working on lately. Uh, and it's heavy, uh, largely because Electrolab used to use a lot of particle board. I'm not sure what this is yet. We're going to find out but uh, that definitely contributes to the weight. Okay, we see that the grill cloth is in great shape and we can see the four 8-inch speakers lurking back there. Let's take a look here at the simulated wood grain contact paper that someone has seen fit to slather all over the outside of the amplifier in a feeble uh, attempt to make it look presentable. Uh, anyone that's ever seen this grain of contact paper will spot this thing a mile away. Okay, this is not the way it came from uh, Electro from Electrolab, thank God. Uh, but uh, we'll see what's underneath. It's supposed to be a very fragile, uh, probably black uh, type of uh, Tolex that is not particularly durable. And sure enough, you can see here through this opening in the magnificent uh, contact paper, uh, kind of a pebbly, really fine pebbly grain black Tolex material that's not much thicker than the contact paper, okay? And probably it didn't hold up and looked terrible, uh, and that's what led to this magnificent bit of uh, custom cabinetry. So we can take a gander at the innards of this jewel. I've removed the back door uh, with this beautifully applied soundproofing material that looks sort of like old yellow foam rubber. Um, I think when I stand it up like this it sort of looks like the headboard in a brothel. Uh, not that I would ever know what that looked like firsthand. Alright, now let's uh, look in here at the very complex innards of this beast. Okay, we've got the amplifier down here on the floor with some fairly massive transformers. We've got four apparently matched 8-inch speakers. We'll check into them in detail in just a minute. And then we have the control panel up here on top with this magnificent uh, kind of a umbilical cord that's going to connect it down here to the amp. Now let's look at the control panel um, and you see we have bass or guitar which tells you right off the bat they knew darn well this was uh, just like the Fender bass going to end up being used like 10 to 1 by guitar players and also an accordion input and I have found by and large that many amps that have accordion inputs generally have pretty good tone okay I don't understand why there would be any connection but uh, that's kind of what I've seen. Let's see, we have the ivory chicken head volume, we have the separate treble and bass controls, and the old trusty on-off toggle. And uh, back here, of course, is our bright red pilot light to let us know when this jewel is all fired up and ready for action. It's a dusty mess, and that same uh, yellow foam has been tastefully uh, stapled all over this thing uh, and some of that rich Corinthian veneer is coming loose from the side. We'll just sort of try to ignore that. Let's take a look now at the amplifier itself. 
First off, two rather massive uh, stand-up transformers here. This is a very husky power transformer and a huge output transformer. Okay, the tubes, the seven, it's all, look at that, GZ34 rectifier, and they weren't fooling around. And a pair of the 7591s, I've looked at the schematic, and we will all look at it in just a few moments. Uh, these babies are fixed bias, okay, no wimpy cathode bias for these. Um, and we've got a couple um, 12AX7s, and then a 6C4. Uh, over here then is going to be our uh, cable connection from the control panel up above which leads us to wonder why if that is the umbilical for the control panel does this large separate bundle of wires come up from the chassis oh this is lovely look at this uh, two of these uh, wire bundles going into I'm guessing where a toggle switch was, an on-off toggle switch. I'm not sure why you'd have a toggle switch here and up here unless this one has been added on to be more convenient. So as you're ready to strum before your wrapped audience, okay, you don't have to kind of crawl over here and bend down and try to find that toggle switch. You'll just saunter over and very coolly flip it on. And if the two mystery uh, cables stuffed into the on-off uh, switch hole are not exciting enough, we see the original power cord comes out here and is skillfully fused to this gorgeous, uh, somewhat stomped on uh, power cord uh, with the trusty uh, two-prong uh, plug attached. Okay, no... Um, pain spared and only the best. All right, so you know already I can tell we got our work cut out for us with this one, but I have high hopes for it because I think 4.8s driven by some fixed bias 7591s is going to have to make some noise, and I'm hoping that it's sweet. Okay, let's uh, check out these speakers, see if we can uh, identify them. First off, for 8-inch speakers, these are good size Alnico magnets here. Uh, let's look at the code on the back of the magnet housing. 328 is Utah. And what do we see here? L056. That doesn't sound like a date. X3645 doesn't sound like a date to me either. Um, I've got to believe that this is uh, a match set of four Utahs that came originally in this cabinet um, for several reasons, just most of them just kind of common sense and intuition. First off, I see no evidence that the knots have been removed and if the speakers have been exchanged, usually at least half of the knots get lost. I can't imagine anybody buying a rather inexpensive amp like this blowing one of the 8-inch speakers and then running out and buying a mat set of four to uh, replace it. So I'm just betting that these are the original speakers and they are not like the speakers I saw in one of these that was uh, shown on the internet. In their, in their case they had RCA speakers. Now I don't know if Electrolab uh, shopped around for speakers, but to be honest, between these and those, I think I'd pick these Utahs. They're pretty slick looking, gold anodized with a purple cone. Pretty snazzy. You know, the speaker wiring is rather unusual. Here is the output from the uh, output transformer, and we have a pair of those speakers in series, and then a second pair in series. The pairs then are wired in parallel. So let's do some quick math here. 4 ohms plus 4 ohms, because they're in series, would be 8 ohms. 4 ohms plus 4 ohms, 8 ohms. 8 and 8 in parallel then would be a net impedance of only 4 ohms. I'll have to use the uh, trusty ohmmeter in a few minutes to uh, measure the actual uh, DC resistance of the voice coils and extrapolate what the impedance is of the speakers and we'll see 
what Electrolab had in mind when they designed this. Okay, time to take this all apart. Uh, I think I'll start off by removing the control panel. And since the umbilical passes behind this uh, lovely foam, I'm just going to go ahead and pull the foam out. Okay, it looks like there's a couple uh, cable holders in here that are uh, holding the cable uh, secure as it comes down here and then plugs into the chassis. After pulling the foam, I can see that I owe Electrolab an apology. They use three quarter inch plywood for the cabinet. So that does make it heavy. Okay, I have to pull out all these staples and uh, unscrew these. The upper clip here, well maybe not. Look at that, quick release. And then uh, I'll be able to remove this control panel. Well, I pulled off the control panel and flipped it over and you see that type of amateurish wiring that starts to make you nervous and uh, looking at the scratches here and all that I have a feeling this is a bright switch because look here 0.01 microfarad and it goes to ground and I'm thinking uh, when you have it in the on position you're gonna get your really deep uh, murky bass tones when you flip the switch off then uh, you'll be preserving your high frequency so it's sort of like a, a bass switch I guess um, okay looks pretty clean obviously some really strange uh, electrical work's been done here but um, and I don't much care for these type of input jacks but anyway it's a start uh, let's put this to the side then and continue with our uh, removal of components and pull out the amplifier. Well I removed the tube set and it's a very pleasant surprise. Uh, all are GE uh, tubes and may well be the original tube set. Um, you get these wafer based uh, 7591's a GZ34 that's a General Electric vintage tube, 212AX7's and then the uh, little 6C4. Okay, so um, I really, I'm kind of starting to get kind of uh, excited here. A really nice original tube set. Alright, I laid the cabinet on its side so I can get at these uh, four screws that hold in the uh, amplifier chassis, but after removing the foam rubber, look at this. Um, a really nice original schematic for the amp. Okay, the uh, H322 schematic. It's a very different format than the schematic that I downloaded on the internet, but hopefully the values uh, will be the same. Um, I guess it has here all the values of the components. Very nice discovery. I've got the chassis out and flipped over so that we can uh, see what's going on in here and we see some Sangamos that we know are generally not trustworthy sort of some waxy capacitor here that probably going to have to be replaced another one that has been replaced I'm betting and uh, also uh, all of the uh, electrolytic caps in the can capacitor that will have to be tested but I'm going to go ahead and replace them anyway just to play it safe and uh, I was looking at this. This is an oddball little piece here, but I have a feeling that's the rectifier for the bias supply. Okay, it might be a little selenium rectifier. Okay, in which case I will break it open and snort the contents. Um, uh, so, all in all, everything looks pretty clean. Uh, some really amateur electrician work here, but so what? You know, it's, it's, uh, you know darn well when you get something like this at a garage sale um, that you're going to have to do some work on it. And it gives me something to do. So uh, let's quit whining and let's get started. Well, I couldn't resist trying to figure out the speaker impedance. Uh, attached my ohmmeter clips to the uh, plug that goes into the amp. So this will be the DC resistance of all four speakers and it's around 8 ohms which means these are probably 8 ohm speakers two of them in series is 16 two of them in series is 16 
16 plus 16 in parallel is going to give you 8 ohm uh, net impedance. Okay, so that problem is solved. Now let's get uh, back to work here on the circuit. Sure enough, looking in here at the cabinet schematic, you see SP1, 2, 3, and 4, 8 ohm speakers. So uh, it did check out. Well, I think the first order of business is going to be to just cut this uh, miserable power cord here and just get rid of it and then rewire the primary circuit so it makes a little more sense. Once they move the power switch up here to the control panel, you've got components spread out then that are normally close together. So they bring the AC in here uh, from the cord and they run one wire through the fuse and right into the power transformer primary. It looks like they run the, and it's not good, either the white wire up to the on off switch and then have it return. Okay, so this really isn't a good way to wire the primary. So I'm just going to remove all of it and start from scratch and come up with a good practical way to do this. All right, I cut all the wires that connected these two strange cables in here to the primary circuit uh, and now I'm going to disconnect the other end of them. I've done it here and I'll have to disconnect it over here so that I can just pull this back out uh, through the hole in the chassis. Alright, those small gauge yellow wires I've removed. Uh, it looks like they broke one of the leads off of the uh, neon pilot light um, and I've removed this and I'll remove it here and then it will come out through the chassis hole. So we're going to get rid of all of the yellow wires and these two hideous cables here as well as the original uh, power cable and uh, come up with a whole lot neater and uh, more uh, realistic way to wire this. Well look at all the trash I've removed so far. Okay, the, those mysterious slender yellow wires, two heavy cables that ran back and forth between chassis and control panel, the original power cord, uh, just a bunch of, of trash in my book. And I think you'll have to agree the control panel looks a whole lot neater, and so does the chassis and the cabinet, now with all that mess removed. Uh, now it's time to come up with a better way to wire the primary circuit. Since the old pilot light was ruined, I drilled and installed a 120 volt AC power light that I will then wire into the on off switch. Well that control panel was really grungy and, and filthy so I washed it and then waxed it with car wax and it's just glossy as can be now. Well, the time has come to take a little workshop break to come in and open a present here from a viewer named David Berlin. Um, I have a, some idea what's uh, in here, uh, but let's open it and see. It looks like Jack and Casey are definitely ready to find out what the contents are. Well, it looks like we've got a nice letter here on top. After watching so many of your videos and learning so much from them, I couldn't help but snag this and send it to you for one of your projects. You may decide it's not a fit. That's okay. If you don't want it, maybe someone you know will take it. I would also uh, appreciate a Jack versus Casey taste test after the full CAT scan, of course. David. Oh, look. Treats. Look here, Jack. Kitty treats. It's a brand I'm not real familiar with, but they sure look good. I think I might try a couple myself. Okay, we'll set these down here where Jack can do his CAT scan. And the object is in here, so I'm going to need both hands. Let me pull it out and we'll take a look. It's beautifully packed with the uh, foam fitting around it to hold it. And I just found a nice pack here of tubes. We'll set that aside. And uh, I'll go ahead and finish opening this so you can see what it is. Well, what a surprise. It's a nearly mint car tube radio. Look at this. Uh, that's the dash panel right there that fits in the hole in the dash and the speaker right above it with a really neat um, 
perforated grill. It's an old AM radio. I'm not sure what this middle knob is for because generally the tuning is there's on off. Tuning over here on the side. Completely self-contained unit. Quite heavy. Absolutely beautiful condition. Just mint shape. Okay, I'm really, really impressed by this. I assure you, David, it is a fit. Okay, I like it. Uh, nobody's going to get this away from me anytime soon. Probably an antenna connection and the fuse. He also sent in a separate box something called a vibrator which I know conjures up all sorts of lewd images but in this case it's an electromechanical inverter this will allow the 12 volt or 6 volt probably in this case a DC of the battery to be converted to AC by sort of a mechanical buzzing contact that uh, creates alternating current that can be stepped up then by the transformers in the radio. Okay, so this is a vital part of making this radio work. Also, all the tubes are here packed up, which I'll open a little later. They're probably Loctal tubes with that steel big prong in the bottom that locks them in place and holds them despite vibration. Okay, uh, with, and that makes them ideal for use in car radios. So, this looks like one heck of a fantastic uh, project. Okay, this would really be something. Okay, and, and uh, no doubt a topic for a future video. So thanks so much, David, from all of us, as, including the kitties. Uh, extremely thoughtful. Also, I know that you made a video about this radio. I was not allowed to look at the video until I'd opened this but I will put a link in um, this video description which will allow viewers to go to your video and watch it uh, so they can see a detailed look I'm assuming inside of this unit and a discussion of how you found it okay and I'm sure they'll find that very interesting so uh, thanks again and uh, I think it's time to go back out in the workshop and get back to work Sure looks like Casey and Jack enjoy the yummies, too. They're snorting them down. What do you think, Casey? Good yummies? Hmm? You can see how slender she's gotten now that she's on her strict diet. I'm kidding. Okay, back to work. There's our svelte little kitty cat. Casey, say hi to everybody at home. Jack just wants more treats. Good boy, Jackie. Jack. Good boy. You know, most uh, Harmony amps have the model number on the control panel, and I didn't think this one did, but once I removed the nut from that add-on switch they put in here, um, you can see MO and 22, so it did say it right there. They just drilled through it. Well, I think I've come up with a reasonable and effective way to wire the separate control panel and amplifier chassis. First off, I've installed a three-wire power cord. It comes in here to the control panel where uh, the green ground wire is bolted down to the uh, metal body of the control panel and the black and white uh, wires from the uh, power cord are connected to the single throw double pole uh, on off switch. Now the advantages of a single throw double pole power switch like this uh, were discussed in a previous video but I'll go over it one more time and uh, the benefit is that when the switch is in the off position both of the wires in the power cord, the black wire and the white wire, are completely isolated from the circuit. Now when you use a single pole single throw switch, which most people do, you're only interrupting or opening the black wire and separating it from the circuit, whereas the white wire is generally hardwired right to the primary of the power transformer. Now that's probably okay if your wall outlet is wired correctly. 
but a bunch of wall outlets aren't. And if yours isn't, then what you think is the white wire that is the return is going to become the hot wire because of the reversal within the uh, receptacle in your, on your wall. And the hot wire is going to be going hardwired into the uh, power transformer primary. Not a good setup. Okay, so to be sure that regardless of the wiring of the wall outlet, that your amp is completely off when the switch is off, uh, is to use a single throw double pole power switch. So the new three wire cord comes in here. It, the uh, metal body here of the uh, control panel is securely grounded and the uh, white return wire and the black wire go into this switch. Then when the switch is on both of them will pass through the umbilical cord down to the amp chassis and circuit. Also the green ground wire of the umbilical cord will be secured to the uh, chassis of the control panel as well as the chassis of the amp so that all metal uh, parts of the chassis and control panel are securely earth grounded. So here's the final wiring. The three wire power cord comes in here and securely grounds the chassis of the control panel. The black and white power wires then run over here to the double pole on off switch. When the switch is on the power then will come uh, through the output wires from the switch through the umbilical cord and down to the amp chassis where the black wire will pass through the fuse and then into the primary of the power transformer. The white wire will come directly into the primary of the power transformer. Okay, the umbilical is now wired into the amp chassis. The black wire goes to the fuse through the three amp fuse and then uh, into the primary of the uh, power transformer. The return wire uh, is hardwired into the other primary wire of the power transformer and the green wire is securely attached to the chassis grounding it. So now we have a brand new three wire power cord and a simple black umbilical cord to the amp chassis instead of all of this garbage. Okay, now uh, let's get to the fun part and that is going to be uh, rewiring this circuit to make it uh, have great tone and reliability. Okay, let me show you a very quick and simple way to uh, determine if all four of your speakers are working, if all four of them are in phase and wired properly. Now they have to be in phase if there's more than one speaker. The reason being is you want the cones all four to be going forward at the same time and all four to be coming back at the same time. That way you'll get uh, especially your bass frequencies portrayed properly. If uh, two of them are in phase with each other and the other two are out of phase, you're going to get a sort of self-canceling, very dead sound from your speakers. Now, step one on this type of speaker plug, there's an outside, what is normally a shield. I've connected a green jumper from it to the negative pole of a 9 volt battery. I connected a red jumper here to the tip of that speaker plug, which is connected to the uh, terminals on the speaker that have red dots. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just touch the red jumper here to the positive end or pole of the battery. You hear the speakers react. But it's kind of hard to tell if the cones are moving in the right direction and if all four speakers are working. So what I'm going to do next is as I touch that red lead to the positive pole of the battery, I'm going to be holding my finger against the cone of each speaker in turn and make sure that each of the cones go forward when I touch the red lead to the uh, positive pole of the battery. 
Now this is real hard to do uh, with just two hands, especially when there's a camera involved, but I've uh, set the battery down here and I'm going to just gently touch my finger to the cone of the speaker, touch the positive pull of the battery, and sure enough that cone moves forward. Let's go over here to the left cone. Yep, it goes po uh, forward. Uh, when I touch the lead to the uh, positive pole of the battery. Now I'll do the top two speakers. Forward, 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 forward. Okay, the speakers are wired properly. All four speakers uh, seem to uh, work and they also uh, respond about equally, okay? So none of the speakers is weak or, or has any real problems. I think we've got a really nice matched uh, four speaker array here that is wired properly. So I think our next step then should be to try this amp out as is and see how it works, if it sounds good or not, and if it doesn't, then uh, what direction can we take to uh, correct that situation? Okay, so let's play a few tunes through this and see what we think. <laughs> pretty lousy, wasn't it? Uh, low volume, uh, kind of real mushy, indistinct sound, even with the treble turned all the way up and the bass turned all the way down. Um, very disappointing. Uh, so I guess uh, we're really going to have to go into this and um, if it really was voiced for bass guitar, maybe undo that and uh, try to get some clarity to this and uh, some decent volume for an amp of this wattage. Okay, so let's begin. Alright, we're going to measure the voltage drop across the winding of the output transformer that goes to the upper tube, the further tube away, 136.8 uh, ohms of resistance in that winding and the voltage drop appears to be about 6.71 and it's fairly stable. So let's write that down. Next we'll measure the voltage drop across the winding for the tube closest to us. It was 141.8 ohms and the voltage drop is lower which means less plate current. What have we seen here? About 5.68 volts uh, of drop. Let me write that down and then we'll do some calculations. Now, since the cathode is grounded, we're measuring the plate voltage from the plate to ground. And we see that it is stabilized pretty well at around 400 volts. Now, with this, we can calculate the plate dissipation for the tube. And here's the biasing measurements for the two 7591s. The voltage drop was 6.71 for the further tube which when divided by the uh, resistance of that half winding gave plate current of 49 milliamps which is fairly high and a plate dissipation of 19.6 watts. The closer tube uh, had lower plate current and a lower plate dissipation of 16 watts. Now the maximum plate voltage for a 7591 is 550 volts, so we're well within that at only 400. But uh, the problem is that the plate dissipation is 19 watts 
That's for cathode biased amps, but for fixed bias, the maximum plate dissipation is only 13.3 watts. That means this particular tube is almost 50% over the maximum. Okay, so we're going to have to check on our negative DC bias supply to make sure that it is up to uh, the challenge of properly biasing these tubes. Uh, if it is, then it's going to have to be adjusted to bring the plate dissipation down to around 13 or maybe a little lower. Now looking at our bias source here, we see uh, it says factory adjusted, so we're going to look to see if there is a, a little adjustment pot, which will sure make things easier. But the output they say that's appropriate is around a negative 19 volts DC being applied right here to those grids. Okay, so let's check and see what we're actually applying. Now to find the proper test point in our circuit to look for our bias voltage is that it enters right up here between two 300 and 90K resistors, which are rather an unusual val value. That's going to be orange, white, yellow. Okay, so uh, we look around and sure enough, orange, white, yellow, orange, white, yellow. This one's going to that tube. This one's going to that output tube. So we're going to go right in between and see what our negative DC bias voltage really is. Well, it's disgustingly close to what it should be, minus 19.13. Okay, so uh, obviously the uh, DC uh, bias power supply is working properly. Uh, this is a selenium rectifier here, which is not uh, a thrilling component to leave in. Uh, I may well replace it, even though the coupling capacitor seemed to be working okay, that the uh, plate current was stable. I, these Sangamos in the past have proven um, really uh, failure prone to me. So I'm going to replace them and when I did I pulled this one and look at this, talk about a cold solder joint. I have, I have not heated or touched this joint. Uh, I was hearing a lot of crackling and other noises in this circuit and boy will this do it. Okay, so I'm going to be sure that the uh, replacement coupling cap is properly soldered in. Well, as you can see, I've replaced that 50 microfarad at 25 volt uh, electrolytic filter for the uh, negative DC bias circuit with a brand new capacitor. And whenever you do this, it seems contrary to what we're used to, but because it's a negative circuit, not a positive circuit like we're used to, the electrolytic is wired in what seems backwards to us, uh, positive to ground, negative to the circuit. Okay, I bet that's a very common mistake, so be sure you don't make it. Here are the big old fat cockroach chocolate drop point ones at 600 volts that I've installed as coupling caps. Okay, those have got to be better than those puny 400 volt Sangamos. And now I've replaced that selenium rectifier right here with a 1000 volt 3 amp diode. Okay, it's always a good idea to change out these selenium rectifiers. They're toxic and they are uh, prone to failure. Okay, and the diode to replace it, which is like 10 times the rectifier that the selenium uh, rectifier was, costs about 25 or 30 cents. Okay, so it's just a uh, foolish not to. Now, to, if you're wondering how to wire it, uh, look over here at the schematic and you'll see that coming out here, this is the bias winding, comes out so that that vertical band is facing the bias winding. Here is the bias output and you see I have the band on the diode facing it. The polarity of diodes is critical. Okay, now I'm checking the bias supply to make sure that uh, my electrolytics in right, my diodes in right, and sure enough, instead of negative 19 volts, though I'm getting negative 21.5, largely because of the more efficient diode rectifier rather than the selenium rectifier. Also, there may have been a little voltage loss through that electrolytic capacitor. So we have uh, increased 
or negative DC bias supply, which may solve the problem with that hot uh, output tube. And don't think I haven't noticed that hum. Uh, we'll address that later. Right now, though, we need to get our voltages correct uh, and also need to replace this uh, 20 microfarad cap because look at the leakage coming out of the end of it right there, out the little vent hole. Um, who knows, maybe this is what's making the hum. We'll see. Here's the new 20 microfarad electrolytic in the circuit and here's a better view of that leakage uh, from the vent hole of the original uh, 20 microfarad at 450. This is never a good sign. Okay, so uh, we have a new cap in place. Okay, let's redo the plate dissipation to see how the increase in negative DC bias voltage that has resulted from our new electrolytic capacitor and our new diode uh, has affected the plate dissipation of this way too hot tube. Remember it was about 50 percent over maximum plate dissipation. Uh, we see that the voltage drop has leveled off here at about 5.39 so let's plug that in and see how that translates to plate dissipation. And we see that we have definitely made a step in the right direction. The original voltage drop was negative 6.71 now it's dropped down to minus 5.39 this means that the plate current has dropped by quite a bit, okay, about 10 milliamps and our plate dissipation is down to 15.8 watts which is a big step uh, in the right direction but still higher than the 13.3 that we were aiming for. So we're going to have to go back into our circuit and I think alter the value of this resistor so that we have higher voltage going this way uh, toward our uh, grids rather than going to ground. Now the way to do that of course is to increase the value of this resistor. Now look in here at the circuit. It seems like I'm not the first person to think those are biased a little high. Remember this was supposed to be 1800 ohms. Well look what's already in here, 2200 ohms to ground. So I'm going to have to go up even higher than that. In retrospect, the reason for that 2200 ohm resistor instead of 1800 is this particular amp circuit I'm working on does not have the adjustable bias. So what they've done is added in an extra 400 ohms here to compensate for the absence of resistance here. I replaced the 22K resistor with a 27K resistor to increase the amount of negative DC bias voltage sent to the grids and bring down the plate dissipation of the output. Okay, we're set up here to measure the voltage drop across the output transformer half winding. We see that that voltage drop is pretty well stabilized here at around a minus 4.11 volts. Okay, let's use that for our calculator. By the voltage drop, by the winding resistance, we see that we have 30 milliamps of plate current, which sounds great, times the 400 uh, plate volts is going to give us 12 watts. That's comfortably under the max of 13.5. So I'm very pleased then with our bias circuit. Now that we have the output tube safely biased at a fairly conservative plate dissipation value, let's start to address that very noticeable hum that we've been hearing every time uh, this circuit is energized. Okay, I'm going to show you a quick trick here that everybody needs to know about narrowing down where hum uh, is coming from. I've got the volume at zero and the hum is barely noticeable. Let's crank up the volume and you notice the hum gets louder if the hum responds to the volume control it is arising somewhere here before the volume control in the circuit this kind of finding tells me it's the input circuit okay to the preamp tube so let's uh, double check it and see if we can't stop that uh, wretched hum okay I flipped over the control panel and let's see what we got here 
an non-self-grounding input, I'm not sure why, two self-grounding inputs, all with a 47K grid stopper resistors. But we know uh, those of us who are familiar with the Fender style of input, we know that this uh, grid stopper uh, resistance will vary depending on which of these we're plugged into. Uh, on on uh, one of them, both of these are going to be in parallel and that will reduce the grid stopper resistance. Okay, now I see a huge amount here of um, bare wire uh, that is picking up all sorts of electromagnetic force. Uh, so let's try to spruce this up. Since the pilot light is AC, um, I used shielded cable all the way over to this point at a distance from that pilot light, uh, put shorter leads on the resistors, and then ran the uh, signal straight into the volume control on another shielded cable. Then I'm looking at the rather shoddy way that they ran the signal from the umbilical over to the grid of the first preamp tube. You notice how it's wrapped. It looks like AC, but it's not. What they've done is the white wire is carrying the signal. The, they just wrap a black wire around it and ground it over here, thinking that that will act as a shield. Okay, and that meanwhile, all the white part of the wire here that's visible is unshielded. So I'm going to replace this really shabby uh, attempt at shielding with a properly shielded cable that's grounded at one end. And in the never-ending quest for hum reduction, I uh, notice that the 6.3 volt filament output had no center tap, so I have created a virtual center tap here with the two 100 ohm resistors to ground. Okay, I've installed one, two, three, four, five, six shielded cables here in the control panel and one down here in the chassis. Um, in an attempt to uh, cut down on the hum, I eliminated a lot of exposed wire with these resistors. So uh, let's turn this on now and see if I've been successful in reducing uh, the amount of hum that we hear. Okay, the amp is on now and there is still a tiny bit of audible hum 60 cycle but you got to admit it's a tiny fraction of what it was and I don't think it's going to be a real issue okay so I think the hum has been pretty well eliminated uh, now let's try it again and see what the tone is like and if we still hate the tone of this, then we're going to have to start addressing that issue. Let's stop the video for just a second and have a brief chat. Okay, have you ever had one of those projects where everything went wrong? Well, this is it for me, I'll tell you. Uh, when I decided to try the second sound check with all the shielded cabling and everything else in the control panel, all my work, replacing all the capacitors, everything. Uh, the home returned with a vengeance. Uh, the garbled sound was as bad or worse than ever. And then finally, to just punctuate the finger that this thing is throwing at me, the, power, uh, the output transformer failed. Okay, so here I sit in reeking vapor, as the old poem goes. The stench of the burned up output transformer probably after a, quite a bit of abuse of operating the tubes at 50% over their uh, maximum plate dissipation, and I'm stuck with a mess. Okay, so that's when I decided to just quit working on this thing. I'll be honest with you, I started on this project back in October last year. Okay, so this thing's been sitting under my welding table, uh, and the object of sneers and derision now for several months. So during this uh, quarantine period, I decided to get it out and finally fix it once and for all. First off, I hunted down a new output transformer that was suitable for 8 ohms and 7591s. Okay, and it's a more robust one than 
was originally in it. Okay, so that I believe is probably what solved a lot of the problem with the garbled tone. Second, if you recall, they had moved the on-off switch up here to the control panel and there was a 115 volt neon uh, pilot light. Okay, you cannot do that up here on this plate and not cause a whole lot of hum with your input circuit. Despite the shielded cables, these thing are, things are like antennas, okay? So what I did was I removed the toggle, I removed the neon pilot light, and moved them down here where God intended that they be in the first place. So that is the transplanted toggle and the a neon pilot light. So no more 115 volts up here in the control panel. Another big issue is this, because it's carrying signal, is a shielded cable. Because of the different potential between the control panel and the chassis, there was a huge ground loop formed through the shielding of the cable. Okay, it was an inescapable source of hum. So, by transplanting toggle switch and neon, so no 120 volts is up here, I eliminated the uh, ground loop and eliminated the source of hum in the control panel. Now, if you remember in the opening uh, shots here of this video, uh, all of those cables that were hanging down everywhere, different colored wires. Uh, remember there were two big fat cables coming out of here going God knows where and all tangled. All of that's been eliminated. All that's left is the single shielded umbilicus here that connects the chassis to the tone controls and volume control up here in the control panel. It's much neater and it sure works better. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with that old saying about trying to cram 10 pounds of crap into a 5-pound bag. Well, to me, that's exactly what they did. Okay, they really made a mess of things. And so, it was up to me to remove that extra 5 pounds of crap and leave behind a very nice, clean, organized, original-looking amplifier. Okay, and now, of course, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, let's plug a guitar into this, turn it around, get our Shure uh, M57 microphone set up, and let's see how this jewel sounds now. Well, we're all set up out here in the workshop using the hydraulic jack as our microphone stand. I wanted to get the effect of all four of those 8-inch speakers, so I spaced the microphone out just a little bit and aimed it right at the center uh, of all four of them. Uh, I'll show you now the uh, adjustments that I have on the volume which is way down. This thing is extremely powerful. I've turned the bass up just about maximum and trebles right in the middle at the 12 o'clock position. Okay, so let's see how this sounds. First off, let's celebrate the absence of that loud 60 cycle hum that's been haunting us. The amp is on now at the settings I showed you and I don't hear a thing other than my next door neighbor moving his trash pail around. So now without further ado let's get Ollie and Jack uh, to play a few tunes for us and see what we think of the mini basement.
I guess that's about it uh, for this video on the Harmony Bass Amp. I'll have to say that this is one of my most frustrating repair jobs that I can ever recall, uh, but fortunately after taking about a month or so off uh, and starting over anew, I was able to resolve the problems with this wretched thing. Okay, and turn it into one of the better sounding vintage amps that I've ever heard. Um, I hope you agree. I also want to uh, send out my uh, traditional thanks to all my PayPal uh, contributors and Patreon patrons. Uh, it's you all that are keeping me on the air and advertising free. And I just want to express my thanks and I'm sure those of other viewers. Should any of those other viewers out there wish to join them in their support of this channel, I will include links in the video description to help you to do so. One other thing, uh, YouTube has started to show by your names and your comments which of you are subscribers and which aren't. And I was surprised at the number of very familiar names that I'm seeing that aren't subscribers. Uh, Jack and Ollie and I would love nothing better than to reach 100,000 subscribers because we'll get a really nice plaque, I understand, from YouTube. So we're setting that as our goal. And I'm going to ask all of you out there, who haven't subscribed yet, please do so and help us reach that 100,000 subscriber plateau.
Step one in installing the tunnel ram and two four barrel carburetors is the removal of the original Offenhauser manifold and six two barrel carburetors as well as the magneto from right back there. Okay, there's the intake manifold. Uh, I'll probably detail and clean it up for uh, resale. And the carburetors are sitting here safely on the workbench with all the bolts, the cap of the um, magneto, the magneto, and I was surprised to see they used a brass gear and as you can see the teeth are very worn. Before I sell this uh, I'll have to replace this gear. You can see there's a hollow pin there that's driven out and I'll get a steel one instead of this stinky brass one. Two of the bolts that held the uh, Offenhauser manifold down to the uh, heads uh, had the bolt recessed way down here in, in this passage and no normal socket wrench could reach it so I had to make kind of a right angle uh, socket here 9 16 so that I could take out that bolt and this one over here but as you can see it was successfully removed and now the miserable task of having to clean and polish the uh, surface here on the head that will mate up with that um, tunnel ram manifold as you can see on the other side before and after the china wall is nice and clean and polished and now I have to come over here and, and do the other side. And here is the finished product. All assembled, uh, plumbed. I use copper for the fuel lines. You see they run back here and go to that fuel block that originally fed the six Stromberg 97s. You can see the linkage is progressive. This one goes from the accelerator to the rear carburetor. This rod ties those two carburetors together so they both operate in complete unison. Okay, you're on the, just like any four barrel, you're on the primaries until the accelerator is pushed hard enough to open the secondaries. So you're running on four primaries until you open the secondaries and you're running on eight barrels. And things get real exciting when that happens. I also polished the valve covers so they would kind of go along with that scoop. I had to get a new water inlet and I like it because it allows the uh, water hose to just make a right angle instead of having to make an S. Uh, as you can see over here still have the fuel pressure regulator. There's the fuel block and uh, no chokes on these. Okay, Let me walk around so you get a look at all different angles. The scoop doesn't obstruct your vision but you can see it when you're riding. We'll go for a ride in a future video but uh, you'll see. Uh, you can see it out there and it's kind of fun to watch it wiggle around as the engine torques. But that's it. Okay so it's done and uh, believe me it uh, works perfectly. Okay, I was very pleasantly surprised. These are Holly 450's okay which are fairly small but when you put two of them together that's 900 CFM which is way more than a 350 needs so you have to be kind of careful uh, with the gas you can't step on it too hard too fast or you'll overwhelm the engine but uh, boy if you uh, once you get to drive it right 
uh, the acceleration is just ferocious. Excellent throttle response. I'm very, very pleased, and I hope you are too. Also, I know don't you don't need to comment on the single master cylinder. I'm going to replace it in the near future. And for those uh, who engaged in the debate over the manifold vacuum or metered vacuum, on this particular uh, setup, the manifold vacuum works fine for the uh, transmission, but I found that the metered vacuum works best for the vacuum advance. Okay, and that's a new Pertronics um, magnetically triggered distributor. It looks old-fashioned. Got the window back there to get to the points to set the dwell, um, but of course there are no points, so it's got that vintage look. And just to prove that cold starts are really not an issue with this, uh, engine now is ice cold. It hasn't been run in several days. Uh, let's see if it'll start up. In conclusion, and in anticipation of a question I know many people will ask, uh, why did I change from the six Stromberg two barrels to the tunnel ram with the two four barrels? Well, recall that I was running just off the two center Strombergs, that's four small diameter barrels. Now I have eight barrels at my disposal, and the car, to be honest with you, runs a whole lot better. It's much, much faster. Uh, it isn't anything against the Strombergs. They're just classic uh, carburetors and all. I'm going to set this on the shelf along with the Magneto and maybe use it in a future build or I could put it back on the 34 Ford in the future if I choose to. So it's not the end of this induction system. It's just a change of pace okay, to kind of spice things up here during our quarantine period.